I'm Steve from William and Mary, and I want to, uh, before I turn it over to Jim Plankish, I want to give the anecdote. Of course, historically, he's been with the core family of Southern campaigns of the American Revolution and this uh, symposium for many, many years, a couple decades, actually. But I want to give the difference between us amateurs and a professional by the best anecdote. Uh, many of you know Utah Springs is my favorite battle. And um, you know, you read history after history, whether it's at a national level or a local level, people go, oh, Green had 2,000, maybe 2,200, maybe 2,400. And the British were equal, you know, 2,000, 2,200, or 24. And then one day, Jim walks into our offices up at Camden, and he says, here, I have the British uh, roster, I guess is what it's called, from the before and the after. And it shows 1,638 men, at most, on the British side. So clearly Green had a, an advantage of probably 500 people. And that's not counting the two to 300 or 350 that were captured in the morning foraging party. So that made the battlefield, even though Green won it, that made the battlefield 2,100 or so down to 1,350 effectives for the other four and a half hours of that battle. That's the difference of knowing a, uh, a wonderful real PhD historian can make. And last but not least, Jim is always humble and willing to help. Jim. Well, thank you, David. And thanks to all of you for turning out today uh, for this event, which we always hope will inform people and that you can go out and take your interest and spread it among others so that people will understand the importance of this era in American history. Tonight I'm going to talk about an almost forgotten unit. It's almost as if these guys have been kidnapped by maybe the Ancient Aliens show on History Channel. Uh, Harrison's Provincial Rangers, which was a South Carolina Loyalist unit. Now before I get into the details on the unit itself, I just want to make sure uh, not everybody understands what a provincial unit is. Uh, it's an uh, interesting distinction. We know you have militia and you have regular soldiers. In the British Army, that's the 71st Regiment, the 60th Light Dragoons and whatnot. But the British also, and they had done it, for example, in the French and Indian War as well, recruited provincial units in their colonies. In this case, Americans who would enter British service Theoretically, at least, and we'll see that didn't happen with Harrison's troops, they were to be trained and equipped as British regulars, disciplined as British regulars, with just a couple of differences. One, they would not enlist as the British troops did for what was basically a lifetime enlistment, although during the Revolution, uh, in order to encourage recruiting in Britain, they did allow recruiting for the duration of the war. So most provincials enlisted for three years or the duration of the war, and they were also given another benefit that regular British troops did not get. They were exempted from having to serve in the West Indies. Now I say, why, why wouldn't they want to go and take a nice vacation? Isn't that where a lot of people go in the winter? Now the West Indies was a heat and disease death trap at the time. It was estimated by the European nations, French, British, Spain, uh, that if you sent the regiment to the West Indies, it would pretty much be entirely rendered useless by death and disease within three years. European troops would often mutiny when they were here, heard that they might go to the West Indies. So uh, in order to encourage American loyalists to enlist, they would be exempted from West Indies service. Now most provincial units, the New York Volunteers, the Volunteers of Ireland, the New Jersey Volunteers, uh, the British Legion, uh, by this point in the war, by 1780, were every bit as proficient as British regular army troops. Uh, they had seen extensive service, uh, they were uh, well disciplined, they were well equipped, and in most cases, well led. But Harrison's Rangers didn't quite uh, get these benefits. We don't know much about them at first. I was able to uncover quite a bit, uh, but the little bit that historians do write about this unit, uh, when they mention it, is not flattering. 
Uh, one historian wrote that John Harrison, the founder and commander of the Rangers, recruited ne'er-do-wells, that somehow he picked up all the troublemakers in the area and put them into his unit. And William Dobie James, who was mentioned earlier uh, as being unreliable, seems to have been unreliable in this case well as well. He did mention uh, that John Harris and his, and his brother Robert were two of the greatest banditti that ever infested the country. He said that before the fall of Charleston, they lived in a wretched log hut by the road near McCallum's, in which there was no bed covering but the skins of wild beasts. <laughs> These guys sound like one step above savages, you know, they come out of this log hut with a club and, you know, <laughs> look around. Uh, on, on a different uh, level, uh, a lot of people might not like this guy, but Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, the British Legion, who served with Harrison, uh, called him a man of fortune and was pretty much impressed by him and, uh, and his troops. So uh, there's some disagreement uh, about what Harrison was like, although it's terribly not favorably portrayed, and his unit is also not favorably portrayed. Uh, they're often described as a band of plunderers uh, of no military value. And uh, in fact, the record is mixed. At times, they fought very well and effectively. Other times, uh, less so, as we'll see, but a lot of that has to do with the lack of training, uh, which I'll go into a little more detail about, that because they did not get this time that many units had to drill and train under British officers. You know, the South Carolina Royalists, another provincial unit organized in St. Augustine in British East Florida, were trained by General Augustine Prevost's younger brother, Lieutenant Colonel Prevost. They had time to get some drill, get some equipment, you know, the officers to learn their duties. Harrison's Rangers, as we'll see, didn't get that. Well, Harrison himself, uh, we know from one of the memorials he submitted to the Loyalist Claims Commission after the war, um, which we could take as pretty accurate because you had to have supporting testimony uh, submitted with it, and he submitted it early in 1783. Later claims, the British the Loyalist Claims Commission, if you submitted a claim for 5,000 pounds, they might give you 1,000 pounds. When people realized they were doing that, the later claimants would inf definitely inflate their claims, figuring, well, if I'm going to ask for five and get one, I might as well ask for 10 and hope to get two. So, but Harrison submitted his claim very early, so uh, it's likely to be accurate, and the supporting testimony indicates that. He was born in Virginia about 1751. So in 1775, he was very young, about 24. We don't know when he came to South Carolina, uh, but by then he was living in the Camden District, which was very extensive. Uh, he had settled on Lynch's Creek and was a farmer. And for a young man, had actually done surprisingly well for himself. Uh, he had prospered uh, on Lynch's Creek. He had a 200-acre farmstead with a house, outbuildings, and an orchard where he lived with his wife and children, not in a log hut covered with wild beast skids, as our friend William Dobie and James would have it. Uh, he also had another 400 acres in another location on Lynch's River and had cleared 50 acres there and planted that in indigo, which as you know is a very valuable export crop. He owned two town lots in Camden, 500 acres of land in St. David's Parish in the present uh, Darlington area. Forty of those had been cleared and were being cultivated. Uh, apparently on some of these properties he also raised corn, uh, which some of which at least he distilled into uh, corn liquor with a 80 gallon still. Uh, he had seven enslaved people performing agricultural labor for him and he owned 150 head of cattle, 200 hogs, and seven horses. This guy's doing pretty well for himself. He estimated the value on his claim at 1,770 pounds sterling. In today's money, that's $414,000. For a 24-year-old guy, I'd have been happy to have a fraction of that when I was 24. Uh, so, yeah, he wasn't living in a log hut. He actually, and that's one of the reasons uh, he was influential in his area. We know that people who were economically successful or politically active tended to be regional leaders, and obviously that would have helped him. 
He admitted that in 1775 he did sign the Continental Association, uh, being circulated at the request of the Continental Congress, although he said in his uh, memorial that he thought it was only to establish a correspondence with Britain uh, regarding repeal of the various tax acts that were uh, had been put in place. And he also said he did serve in the revolutionary militia, but that he ne was never with any party in opposition to the king's troops, which is certainly believable because, you know, in the Lynch's Creek, now Lynch's River area, uh, there weren't any military actions at that point in the war. Once the Declaration of Independence had been signed and approved by the Continental Congress, and news of it reached here. He refused, however, to take the oath of allegiance to the state government or the Congress, and he was, as he said, obliged to quit my plantation and hide out in the woods to prevent being harassed by his pro-revolutionary neighbors, and he continued to live that way until early 1779. So, uh, and there were other people we know who lived that way, uh, rather than take the oath, they would you know, hide somewhere, come into a home at night, or their wife would go out into wherever they had a shelter and bring them food. And uh, So this was a, a rough several years for John Harrison. After the British captured Savannah, in, which was at the end of December 1778, he learned of it the next month, and in January 1779, he traveled probably on foot all the way uh, to Georgia, and offered his services to the British, and General Prevo assigned him to carry intelligence to the Loyalists in South Carolina to get information, bring it back, and to hold himself and any people who were uh, Loyalists in readiness to join the King's army uh, when it came. So uh, he was engaged in that. We don't have any details of it, but apparently he was moving back and forth between Savannah, Georgia, and this area bringing information and reports for the British and gathering intelligence and uh, taking it back. He apparently was away from Savannah during the 1779 siege uh, that was discussed earlier. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Hamilton, who commanded the Royal North Carolina Regiment, another provincial unit, um, recorded that he met Harrison for the first time right after the siege, that Harrison had come into the lines with intelligence for General Prevo, and Another loyalist, Nicholas Welsh, met him at about the same time and described him as a very useful and a very loyal man. And he continued to assist the British in Georgia until 1780, when Clinton's army landed and the troops from Savannah marched up to reinforce Clinton. Apparently, he went with them. And sometime during the siege, or shortly after the fall of Charleston, he returned home uh, to his family briefly. On June 4th, 1780, he shows up in Camden, where Cornwallis has just shown up as well and has established a temporary headquarters, and told Cornwallis that he could raise 500 men in a provincial unit for service with the British. Cornwallis was actually impressed with him and immediately commissioned him major commandant of the South Carolina Rangers, a provincial force to be placed on a provincial establishment. Uh, many of the recruits uh, did join the Rangers, but the numbers were never uh, what he hoped, and we'll touch on that again a little more in a minute. Hamilton thought that Harrison at one point or another, maybe at various times combined, brought about 200 men to Camden, and, uh, and he was also impressed with him. He said he's a man of very good character and has a great influence with the people in the Lynch's Creek area. Um, so, uh, Hamilton also wrote that in the early days of the British occupation, Harrison and his men were useful in keeping the country quiet uh, during the early summer in the, in the Lynch's Creek area. Cornwallis was pretty pleased, as I said, and he wrote to Clinton to be afterward. He said, I readily agreed to a, pros a proposal made by Mr. Harrison to raise a provincial corps of 500 men to be composed of the natives of the country between the PD and Watery, and in which it is at present extremely probable he will succeed. Well, immediately things go wrong. Colonel Archibald MacArthur in the 71st Regiment of Highlanders is sent to Chira to occupy a post there. And 
They are also told that they are to cover the raising of Major Harrison's corps and to assist in training the new men. But the 71st is unable to stay at that post. Why? This is something we tend to overlook, and if I hadn't been asked to do some research on it for a couple of exhibits at uh, Historic Camden on disease and the revolution, I didn't realize how important that was. The Highlanders are getting sick. They're coming down with malaria, uh, possibly some other diseases. Some people thought that it might have been yellow fever as well. And they're getting sick, and they can't serve, and they're sending some to Georgetown, uh, to the hot, uh, temporary army hospital there. They're sending some to an army hospital they're putting together in Camden. And MacArthur writes to Rodden, who now Cornwallis has gone uh, back to Charleston, and uh, MacArthur's writing to Rodden, and my men are falling sick very fast. What do I do? So Rodden says, well, get out of that area. It's unhealthy. They didn't understand disease transmission the way we do, but they did have an association between swampy territory and disease. They believed it was some kind of miasma emanating from the swamp. If so, I'd have been sick a long time ago. I've had Siberian Huskies. The male I used to have, and now my female, they could find a swamp in the middle of the Sahara Desert and plunge right into the middle of it. Uh, so, and I've never gotten any sickness. Of course, it was the mosquitoes that were transmitting the diseases. They didn't know that, but they did make the association. So Rod ordered MacArthur to take his regiment Black River. When things didn't improve, he ordered the whole regiment back to Camden, and a lot of the troops went into the hospital there. So that seriously impeded Harrison's recruiting, as well as depriving the troops of being trained by the 71st, which were a highly skilled veteran regular force with a great reputation. Uh, those officers could have done a good job training these recruits, uh, but now uh, basically Harrison's alone without any British Army support try to raise a unit and the revolutionaries are going to get active again once the 71st is gone and create troubles. He had already been pressed into service a little uh, too early. Some of his men uh, and on June 12th they did do a muster roll and they showed five officers and 68 enlisted men in three companies which actually isn't bad recruiting for eight, the first eight days. Uh, but they got pressed into service immediately uh, before the 71st got to Chura, they were sent ahead uh, to scout the march. And the night before the British arrived, uh, they got there. They reported that the revolutionaries were removing supplies. Uh, when MacArthur got there, uh, he investigated that, uh, learned that there were no Americans in arms in the vicinity. Uh, then, so he, on June 13th, Harrison was sent to Camden to recruit with MacArthur's dispatches. He was back in Chiron on June 18th when MacArthur heard that those provisions and supplies that were being hidden included a quantity of salt and rum concealed in a swamp, and he ordered the rangers to find it and retrieve it, and they did do that. In late July, Harrison's back in Camden uh, to meet with Lord Rodden, commanding the garrison. And he told Rodden, according to Rodden's report, that he had collected 400 men who were to be mustered on the 5th of August. But before the muster could take place, Cornwallis told Rodden that he was frightened about the situation of the country between the lower part of PD and Santee. This is the insurrection that is starting. And because there were no troops at Chira to handle it, Major Weems was in Georgetown with the 63rd Regiment, but those troops were also very sickly, uh, so his force had been reduced. Uh, Cornwallis was trying to figure out how to then support the Loyalist militia he was trying to organize in an area without regular troops to support them. And so uh, he wrote that since MacArthur left Chiraz, Cornwallis said, the rebels have inflicted terrors and great distress on the Loyalists in, that, in uh, these areas. Of course, that's not going to help Harrison's recruiting if the revolutionaries are harassing you, you're probably not going to leave your family alone at home. So, uh, Cornwallis said it's absolutely necessary to inflict some exemplary punishment on the rebels in that part of the country. And he suggested that he could send Samuel Bryan's North Carolina militia and Harrison's rangers with a small regular force to restore order in the area and, as he put it, 
With the word discrimination strongly impressed on their mind, they might be trusted to punish the guilty by securing those who they could catch and by burning and destroying the plantations of those who have fled. So Cornwall say we want to suppress this, but we need to distinguish between loyalists and revolutionaries. We don't want to be burning out our friends. So Major James Weems is sending similar reports of partisan activity uh, from Georgetown that causes Cornwallis, as he put it, very great concern. So on July 30th, he tells Weems, he says, why don't you advance toward the Black River against the partisans? And he said, I'll have Rodden send provincial troops to meet you at the high hills of Santee, and then I will have Harrison's Rangers join you as well. Cornwallis said at the time, that corps is reported to me to be nearly complete. They have been in the country about Lynch's Creek, and I should apprehend must have kept the militia quiet in those parts. They are ordered to Camden to receive arms and clothing, but I do not believe they are moved yet. <clears throat> well, the maneuver didn't take place when Cornwallis wanted it because Horatio Gates was coming down with his continental troops, and that put an end temporarily to the anti-partisan operations. <clears throat> Cornwallis now began to press Rodden to get the Rangers ready, said, I wish you could get Harrison's Corps to Camden as early in August as possible, whether complete or not. Tell them that clothing, arms, and money will be sent there for them. Get these guys over here. We need to concentrate our forces. Uh, the Rangers were in Camden, we know for sure, on August 13th, uh, where they were mustered. Nowhere close to the strength that uh, Harrison said he was going to bring 400 men. He had in addition to the five officers, eight sergeants, 64 rank and file present and fit for duty, and 20 rank and file without arms. So he's got about 100 men at this point. We don't know what they did during the Battle of Camden. They may have been assigned to garrison the town. Uh, that's the most likely. There's no mention made of them actually participating in the battle, uh, but garrison duty seems likely. Rodden did say he used uh, some armed enslaved people uh, who had escaped to the British, some militia and other forces as a garrison uh, when he went north to try to delay gates. Uh, so it's likely uh, that was the case. Well, what happened with Harrison uh, and also with the South Carolina Royalists uh, who had been serving since 1778, once they went back to to the back country, most of those men actually decided to join the militia and leave the provincial service, so they had to be re-recruited, and that was moving slowly. And so Cornwallis was getting um, a little pessimistic, to say the least, about his ability to raise provincial units in South Carolina. But when he wrote to Lord George Germain, his superior in London, of course, he put spin on it, like everybody does. Uh, he, wrote, he told Germain on August 20th, uh, that he had taken every measure in my power to raise provincial corps and to establish a militia as well for the defense as for the internal government of South Carolina. One provincial corps to consist of 500 men was put in commission to be raised between the PD and Watery by Mr. Harrison with the rank of major, and another of the same number was ordered to be raised in 96th District to be commanded by Robert Cunningham. <clears throat> we know what happened to Robert Cunningham. He said, if I did Recruited provincial corps could take all my best militia men away. And well, we don't want to weaken the militia. Nothing happened. Um, and Cornwallis insisted that he says there appears to be great reason to expect that both these units will be soon completed, as well as the first South Carolina regiment. That's the Royalists who are trying to replenish their ranks now that a lot of the men have left the service. But when Cornwallis wrote to his Direct Superior Clinton, who he knew would have better information in New York than you would have in London. Uh, at the same time, he said, uh, just three days after he wrote to Gervais, he said, I'm sorry to say, I fear Major Harrison will totally fail in his attempt to raise a corps. So just being a little more optimistic there. <coughs> so after sometime after the Battle of Camden, the, the Rangers go back to the Lynch's Creek area, the PD area. And this is where James says that uh, the people had begun organizing in the Williamsburg and Georgetown regions uh, because Gates' return with the, the Continental Army had inspired them to uh, begin resisting again, and that the Tories on Lynch's Creek responded, and this is obviously Harrison's Rangers, uh, with what he termed murders and depredations. 
He said they killed three respectable citizens and some others, and that the perpetrators were headed by the two Harrisons who were accumulating much wealth through plundering. Of course, as we know, he didn't care for the Harrison family, so uh, this may be an exaggeration, but they apparently were definitely working in a, whatever anti-partisan effort they could on their own. Uh, we know in, the late, in late August, on the 27th, Francis Marion learned that the Rangers uh, was, were north of King Street uh, with Weems uh, and the 63rd Regiment. Um, and, of course, Marion uh, had been operating after he had met with Gates. He had uh, undertaken uh, some operations. He had kept, he had, well, recaptured 150 of the prisoners from Camden being sent to Charleston, although most of them were so demoralized. They went on their own and submitted as prisoners. Um, gives you an idea of how bad morale was. Uh, and he learned that Ganey's militia, Loyalist militia, Weems and the 63rd and the Rangers were all in the area. And uh, even though he and other partisans had had some success in the area, uh, he decided to retreat to North Carolina. And Cornwallis, by now, he's very angry at the uprising and he feels he's got the upper hand after defeating the Americans at Camden. On August 28th, he orders Weems to go and take these harsh measures. As soon as he conveniently can, Cornwallis said, set out with the 63rd Regiment, 100 men from Hamilton's Royal North Carolina Regiment, Harrison's Rangers and Bryan's North Carolina Militia, and sweep the area from King's Tree to PD and return by the Chiraz. And Cornwallis's orders are, I would have you disarm in the most rigid manner all persons who cannot be depended on and punish the concealment of arms and ammunition with the total destruction of the plantation. So Weems is not acting on his own. He is actually carrying out Cornwallis's orders. Cornwallis is angry uh, with this. And he adds that anyone who submitted to the British took the oath and has since joined the rebels in this second revolt must have their property entirely taken from them or destroyed and themselves taken as prisoners of war. When Weems finishes this task, this mission, he says, inspect what Harrison has got by way of a corps. If he has 150 good men, form them into three companies and send them to Bucks Corps to be provided with necessaries and clothing. They still haven't even gotten their equipment and clothing. They're still wearing civilian clothes and using their own personal weapons, apparently, uh, at this point, uh, roughly two months after they were first approved to be organized. And so Weems, uh, of course, carried that out. And uh, the Rangers participated on that mission. Uh, they did help distinguish between loyalists and uh, revolutionaries in terms of destruction of property and arresting people and whatnot, uh, and in, you know, showing the roots of March. Uh, but they were a part of this, and of course, that didn't make them any more popular in the area. Uh, while they were getting ready to do this, uh, Cornwallis was still writing uh, to Major Robert England. I don't believe Harrison has got 50 men. Uh, he said he revoked the order to send them to Monk's Corner to be equipped. Uh, and then he admits to Lord George Germain, uh, he says, I must say that I omitted mentioning before that Major Harrison has failed in his attempt to raise a provincial corps. Uh, it, then he tells Nisbet Balfour, who's commandant to Charleston, he says, well, he'll never raise a corps, uh, but he should be able to uh, raise some people to defend the region, <coughs> their own property, unless he's lost all influence in the country. So he still got hopes that they can get some service out of this. So the Rangers, as I mentioned, do uh, participate in this expedition, pointing out who are revolutionaries, who are loyalists. Uh, yeah, and uh, they help uh, Weems and the others take about 20 prisoners. And of course, uh, Weems brags towards the end that in the one, just on the previous day, he says, I made a foray of 56 miles during which we burnt and laid waste about 50 houses and plantations, mostly belonging to people who have either broke their paroles or oath of allegiance that are now in arms against us. So uh, they apparently uh, served on this raid, although um, Weems was not uh, impressed. Cornwallis told 
Weems afterward, when he got his report, he says, leave Harrison and the militia to keep some kind of hold on the country. Meanwhile, I'm going to send Thomas Fraser of the South Carolina Royalists and 50 mounted men from that regiment to join them and try to organize a militia or independent provincial companies. Uh, and Weems replied that he couldn't obey the order, he says on October 1st. He said he was going to take his entire detachment, including the Rangers, to Camden instead. Uh, he said, in regard to Harrison's <coughs> corps, I am convinced, were they to be left here, that they would disperse in two or three days. They are, if possible, worse than militia. Their whole desire of being to plunder and steal and, when they have got as much as their horses will carry, to run home. Uh, not very, not a very good report. Although, for the plundering, if you could imagine Harrison and other people, Harrison's property was burned by the revolutionaries, and some of these other people probably suffered as well. Similarly, now that it's their chance to get back and compensate themselves for their losses, so they probably figure this is pretty well justified. So, uh, and any, Weem says, in any case, uh, the PD region can't be held by militia, even with a small detachment of the Royalists or Harrison's provincials. So, uh, he said, Weem said, even though we just completed sweeping the area, the rebels are already burning houses and distressing the loyal in a most severe manner. So, you know, they went through, inflicted punishments, now it's switched back, and their supporters are, are the ones uh, being punished. So, uh, what do they do about the PD region? If Cornwallis wants to invade North Carolina, he wants to secure this area. Well, Colonel Robert Gray of the Loyalist Militia thinks that they can secure it with a strong force to protect the loyal inhabitants, and he's he writes to Cornwallis, he says, put 100 regular troops in Chara with 300 well-affected militia from some other part of the province, not local people, uh, and Harrison as a corps. He says, with this number, you, you can scour the frontiers occasionally and secure the different ferries on PD between here and Georgetown. He said, this will effectively cover Williamsburg Township and King Street and create an opportunity to restore the public peace. Cornwallis likes the idea. So he tells Lieutenant Colonel George Turnbull of the New York Volunteers, who at the time is commanding at Camden, uh, to send 80 men from the Royalists, mounted veterans, uh, under Fraser, uh, to the, the area. And he believed, since he was planning to advance uh, to Charlotte, that his advance would drive back some of the Americans, isolate them more, and that once the uh, Frazier and his troops and the Rangers got to Chara, they could form a militia with Colonel Gray's help and raise another perhaps two or three independent provincial companies for service. He said, but in short, uh, you need to get three, two or three hundred men to cooperate uh, with the Loyalist militia there. But then uh, Cornwallis starts worrying that the militia units that are already in the region, the Loyal Militia units, might meet with some serious disaster, he says. So he told Turnbull to take 30 New York volunteers and the 50 from the Royalists under Fraser, and then order Harrison and some of the best militia you could get uh, to prevent the enemy from undertaking anything against our militia posts. Uh, keep them moving and try to give them a blow when you can. Well, Turnbull isn't as optimistic as Cornwallis or Gray. Uh, he has. Uh, he replies to Cornwallis, he says, when Harrison comes to Camden with his corps, we'll try to fit them out as well as we can. He says, Major Fraser is still recovering the, from the wound he received at Musgrove's Mill. He's not ready to take the field. Um, but in a few weeks yet. Uh, so uh, then he says, he repeats, he's apparently he had talked with Weems or got a letter from Weems. Uh, he tells Cornwallis, Harrison's corps, Weems says, are not worth anything. There is but 50 of them, irregular and plunderers, and are all dispersed. Harrison has gotten out to assemble them, and in a week, I suppose, we may see him. He also said, I don't think the PD effort's worth attempting. I'd look upon myself as highly culpable at present were I to send out any detachment to be sacrificed. So he said, if you want, I know you ordered it, but I don't want to do it. If you want to repeat your orders, I'll do it, but you know, I don't want to do it. But the whole plan gets squashed before it ever gets off the ground because, of course, the defeated King's Mountain. Cornwallis has to retreat from Charlotte to Winsboro. 
and of course the loyalist militia is badly demoralized after that. So the uh, the revolutionary militia in October burns Harrison's house and uh, carries off his slaves and. At the same time, there's an interesting piece of correspondence. Captain Frederick de Peister of the New York Volunteers writes to Cornwallis and says, oh, I've just been talking with Harrison, and he says he's got more men than he was authorized to raise. So with your permission, I'm going to take 25 of them for the New York Volunteers. Cornwallis never replied, which is obvious. I mean, where did Harrison couldn't get his authorized strength, but he's supposed to now get more men. Uh, I think de Peister's just trying to strengthen his force by taking from another unit, um, so uh, there's no evidence to reply. On October 14th, uh, one of John Harrison's brothers, Robert, who was a captain in the Rangers, was killed. Uh, we have no details, it was probably a skirmish, uh, and uh, they apparently were still you know, going from Camden out into the, uh, to the east and northeast, but uh, not seeing a whole lot of Action. In late October, Turnbull says that the men are now six miles from Camden, and he and Major England are going to ride out and inspect them. Uh, he apparently never went, but on October 29th, he told Lord Rodden that England had visited their camp and would report their state and condition. It would be nice to have that report, but we don't have it. So uh, the Rangers then undertake another expedition with another British officer. Cornwallis has now sent Tarleton to the eastern region to try to go after Marion. That's the uh, famous Tarleton versus Marion campaign. And the Rangers are assigned to work with Tarleton. We usually don't hear about that uh, aspect of it. Uh, Tarleton is near Lynch's Creek on November 3rd and writes to Cornwallis that I shall see Major Harrison or some intelligent part of his people tomorrow morning, and then he would move in a moment's warning if he learned the enemy was within striking distance. The Rangers, or however many of them, can turn out with their commander, accompany Tarleton on this expedition. Uh, they serve as guides and you know, will they do whatever is necessary. But as we know, Tarleton is unable to uh, bring Marion to battle. Uh, Marion sets up an ambush for him at one place, but Tarleton goes in a different direction. And then um, he tries to lure him in, but uh, into an ambush, but Marion gets word. Uh, so eventually, of course, Tarleton takes off after uh, Marion. Uh, after on the morning of November 8th, he learns that uh, where Marion is, uh, but he chases him 26 miles, can't catch up with him. Uh, but it does report that Harrison's men did take a few of Marion's uh, stragglers prisoner, and then he is ordered to deal with Thomas Sumter instead. Uh, and at which point. Uh, he says that the people in that tract of country, including generally both banks of the watery Santee and Petey down to the seacoast, are now accepting Harrison's party on Lynch's Creek, either ready or preparing to join Mary. So, uh, again, another failed expedition. But uh, the Rangers uh, did better on this. And Cornwallis is now thinking of putting a post in King Street uh, with 50 men from the Royalists and other provincials, uh, including Harrison's. Uh, if he can make anything of them, he says, uh, but that's uncertain. So he suggests, he says, he writes to Rodden and says, you know, I think we should do this. Uh, Rodden says, I've discussed your plan with Tarleton when he was here, stopped at Camden on his way back to operate against Sumter. He says, he's strongly against the undertaking. Rodden says, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. Um, but you also want me to convert the New York volunteers to cavalry. I can't do that in a couple of days. It's going to take time. He said, meantime, I'm going to use Harrison's men as dragoons, because from what Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton says of them, I don't know whether it will not be eligible to keep them mounted. <laughs> Tarleton actually had a high uh, opinion of how the Rangers had served with him as a cavalry role. So, I mean, this guy is, uh, is a pretty demanding officer, but, uh, but he's fairly impressed with Harrison. So Rodden has it at the time also <coughs> says, well, you know, Committed loyalists like this are valuable, you know, we, we, we need them. Uh, he loses some of that faith on November 21st. He's in the middle of writing a letter to Cornwallis when he's interrupted. Uh, the Rangers are in Camden, and he writes, uh, breaks off his letter, comes back, says, I just had to deal with what he called a curious incident. 
He said, Harris's people have long been impatient for clothing. It arrived yesterday, last night. Some of them started a notion that if they took clothing, they were liable to be drafted into regular regiments. Take the clothing, maybe they'll put you in the 71st or the 23rd or somewhere else, and you won't be in your own unit. In consequence, three-fourths of the Corps have gone off, Rodden said. I've been talking to those who remain, but they don't seem satisfied. They want to plunder and not do regular duty. I hope I shall settle it without difficulty. So, again, Rodden, who had just got a good report from Carlton, is now thinking, I can, this is a pretty useful force. Well, now, not so quick to enjoy it. Uh, a few days later, Rodden does write to Cornwallis. Harrison's people are all in good humor. Uh, most of the absentees have rejoined him, and he sent some of them uh, to Winsboro with dispatches for Cornwallis. They arrived on November 25th, and Cornwallis wrote back. He said, the officers did not look quite so smart as the men, who really make a very soldier-like appearance. And he sent the rangers back to, his, to Camden with his correspondence, keeping a few to bring out the letters later. So Cornwallis was impressed with it once he saw. So you see this with the rangers. Well, they're very good. Uh, no, they're not good. They're, no, oh, okay, they're not bad. Well, on the night of December 4th, 1780, two more of Harrison's brothers are killed, not in battle, um, but murdered by revolutionaries in a house. Uh, as Rodden wrote, uh, the house was eight miles south of Camden, and Rodden wrote, a scouting party of rebels burst into the house, shot both the sick men in their beds, though they were incapable of making the least defense, and afterwards murdered the old man of the house in the same manner. So uh, this is a, an act of cruelty by the revolutionaries. So Harrison has now lost three brothers in just a couple of months. Uh, he still has one brother left. Uh, when the murders took place, uh, the rest of the rangers were actually conducting an operation near Chira on November 27th. Major England ordered Harrison to send a patrol out on the Chiraz Road. Well, instead of doing that, Rodden told Cornwallis, Harrison marched with his whole force and has not yet returned. He says, I should, be, I should not be able to guess where he was were it not that at least a dozen terrified militiamen have been with me to swear that a thousand rebels in blue and red coats um, <clears throat> and three-quartered hats were scoured the whole country between the branches of Lynch's Creek. <coughs> British hadn't got enough red uniform coats, so apparently some of Harrison's men were uh, outfitted in, there's one reference to it as Russian drill jackets, which I couldn't find any description, but apparently these were blue coats, uh, probably short jackets, which would have been more suitable for cavalry if they acting as dragoons. So they were out on patrol, but they were wearing these blue coats, so the loyalist militiamen, oh no, where did the whole American army come from? Uh, and Rodden was a little worried that the rangers were marching into trouble. He said, I'm under, under some apprehension that Harrison and his corps will get into a scrape. I should be grieved on many accounts that any misfortune should happen to them, although for not following their orders and just setting out a patrol, he said, they deserve a little chastisement, maybe. Um, and he said, if they don't get themselves beaten or dispersed, they will probably soon return. Uh, and if the enemy has moved in that direction, they must bring me certain information of it, uh, which they did. Uh, he got a dispatch on November 30th uh, reporting uh, there were no uh, militia, partisans, or regular troops in the area from the Americans. And Rod ordered him to return to Camden, uh, and he told Fort Wallace, I don't think he can do much service where he is, and he might get into a scrape. Cornwallis, we don't associate Cornwallis with humor, right? I mean, he's always a serious guy. He's always complaining or unhappy or feuding with Henry Clinton or you know, trying to kiss up to Lord George Germain or whatever. Uh, but in this case, Cornwallis actually shows a little bit of dry wit. He replies to uh, Rodden's letter. He says, as to Harrison, I shall be perfectly satisfied if he does not lose the good blue coats. <laughs> <laughs> That's not all he's expecting at this point. Just don't lose those uniforms we gave you, Ben. In mid-December, Rodden sends the 64th Regiment under Captain Dennis Kelly and 50 mounted rangers, so they've, they've still got a substantial number of guys in the field, to the high hills of Santee uh, to create some kind of post, do something against Marion and try to protect the Loyalist militia. Then he gets a second uh, 
reinforced unit available. The provincial light infantry arrives. These are drawn from northern provincial regiments, the light infantry, from I think six different regiments. They're under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John Watson of the Guards. Uh, they arrive at Nelson's Ferry on the Santee on uh, December 25th, Christmas Day. They're not taking time to uh, cook turkey or anything, they're marching. And uh, Watson requests from Rodden that he be reinforced with cavalry. Uh, Captain Samuel Harrison, who's still alive at this time, apparently must be six brothers, right? Although one of them could have been the father. The relationships aren't clear. It's also James Harrison who shows up somewhere else as well. Uh, so Rodden sends 20 mounted rangers under Samuel Harrison, uh, who is a captain. Uh, the rangers guide him to the Indian Mound on the Santee River where he builds the fort, and he names it after himself, of course, Fort Watson. The rangers are a number of the rangers, probably not the whole unit, although it's not a big unit, but, you know, figure 20 to 50, depending on different times, are stationed at Fort Watson. Um, they're involved in various incidents, uh, one of which, again, uh, results in an unnecessary death on uh, January 13th. Watson reports this. Uh, one of Harris's men, John Stilwell, uh, was out on patrol. Uh, they were came under rebel fire and his horse threw him. He was taken prisoner and surrendered. Uh, he was asked for his pistol, Watson wrote. He delivered it up and was immediately shot through the body with it. Uh, he complained of this behavior and was abused in order to deliver his sword. He did it was cut through the skull in five or six places with his own sword. Uh, they said some of his friends came, took him to a house, and tried to care for him. They said he kept his senses for two days and then died. So, uh, uh, you can see maybe why Harrison can't get a whole lot of volunteers. Two of his brothers murdered in bed with smallpox. This guy you know, surrendered, taken prisoner, and killed with his own weapons after he turns them over. So, uh, he's still active and uh, they take part, uh, Watson, on Rodden's orders, uh, takes action against Sumter. Sumter had attacked Fort Granby, failed to capture it. Now he is moving around, uh, capturing wagon, a wagon train, you know, fighting other skirmishes. Uh, so, uh, Rodden told Watson, get out there and do something. Uh, Watson goes, heads out on February 24th with his light infantry and the mounted rangers. Uh, they get into a battle with Sumter, and Rodden reported after the enemy were forced to fly, leaving 18 dead on the field, several wounded, and 40 horses. He's accounting the wounded that they left. Watson took 38 prisoners. Uh, the British lost only one officer and seven men wounded, and Rodden noted that said, Harrison's people, mounted and armed with swords, behaved very gallantly, routing the enemy's cavalry regularly formed and thrice their number. So here they are again fighting well. Uh, so, out there then in March, Broaden undertakes his operation against Marion, uh, the two prong attack, Watson uh, <coughs> undertaking what's known as the Bridges Campaign, while Doyle marches to hit Marion's base at Snow's Island. Uh, there's no 100% certain documentary evidence that the Rangers were with Doyle but it's very likely that some of them would have been there to act as guides. Uh, a lot of the other rangers are with Watson, uh, so they participate in the various skirmishes at Waipu Swamp uh, about March 9th, uh, at Mount Hope Swamp the next day, or maybe a couple of days later, the dates of this, nobody agrees on some of them. They put several days apart when these actions occurred. Uh, and at the last battle, battle in late March, uh, at the Sam Pitt River, when Watson has decided to go to Georgetown because it's just his, the same distance as going back to Fort Watson, but there he can replenish more easily uh, because it's still in, under British control. Um, his light infantry crosses the bridge that Marion's men have partly destroyed, uh, but Marion has sent other people around uh, to the opposite side of the river to attack the rear of Watson's force. Um, they start firing on the 64th Regiment, uh, then they're forced to fall back some distance, but they continue firing. And Watson orders the Rangers, who he says uh, were armed with cutlasses and other sword like instruments, to make a cavalry charge on Marion's men and drive them off. The Rangers instead panic. 
And Watson doesn't really blame them for this. As he explained it, he said, they were afflicted by one of those panics which are never meant to be accounted for in the very instant of charge. You know, some troops, even good troops, um, yeah. Some days it's just not their day. I mean, look at the uh, at the Maryland Regiment at Hopkirk's Hill, right? That's thrown into disorder. You know, after everything they'd seen, you know, and John Eager Howard wrote that after. He said, you know, the men just didn't fight well that day. That's basically it. Uh, so it's, they don't charge, and uh, so they're trying. And so they're uh, trying to gallop in different directions. And uh, Watson says they would have rode over the 64th if Captain Kelly hadn't ordered his men to present arms and swear that he would shoot them uh, if they didn't. You know, so they they stopped. They didn't run away. Uh, the rebels and the British fought a little bit, uh, but then. You know, Watson's horse was shot, but the action ended. Uh, but the Rangers, again, wasn't their best day. Uh, what happens after that? Well, most of them are obviously at Georgetown with Watson. But there are some at Camden. And apparently, they either fight or garrison the town of Hopkirk's Hill. We know some of them fought uh, because in the return of the men who were wounded that day, um, Captain Harrison is mentioned as one of the wounded British officers at Hopkirk's Hill. So he may have been recovering from an illness. Remember, Rodden raised a company of 50 men, dragged them out of the hospital, called them the convalescents, and said, fight. Or maybe the Rangers weren't there. They might have been attached to the South Carolina Royalists who were there, uh, the other provincial unit. They don't see much action after that because, of course, in early May, the British abandoned the back country. They evacuated Camden on the night of May. 9th to 10th, and fall back. Harrison and his rangers evacuate to Charleston, at least most of them do. Apparently, as many as 300 men, and possibly a lot of their family members from the Lynch's Creek area who are loyalists, also went to Charleston. Um, about three quarters of them are estimated to have left late in the year because they were afraid that they were going to be pushed into military service. Um, in October 1781, Alexander Leslie, who's now taken command, uh, has decided that just all these cavalry units and fragments of units, militia cavalry, provincial cavalry, uh, you know, there's a troop of the Queen's Rangers, you know, the South Carolina Royalists have been mounted by this time. So he decided he's going to consolidate it. <clears throat> uh, and as Harrison wrote, he said in October 1781, uh, his men were drafted from him into the Royalists, except he was given, Leslie offered him, you can either retire as a major, go off duty on half pay, or I can reduce you to captain, and you can keep about 50 of your men. So obviously he had more than 50 if there were some going into the Royalists. Uh, you can keep about 50 of your men as an independent cavalry troop. Harrison, to his credit, and Leslie praised him for this, says, yes, okay, I'm going to take the rank reduction and stay in service with my independent troop of cavalry, uh, which, uh, which he did, uh, although that was eventually incorporated into the Royalists uh, many months later. Uh, what they do after that is uncertain because the British officers by this time, their references are terrible. They'll call the South Carolina Royalists the Rangers when it's clearly the Royalists. They'll call the Rangers the Royalists when it's the opposite. Sometimes they'll just say the South Carolina Provincials or the South Carolina Dragoons. And if they don't mention an officer, it's almost impossible to determine what unit they're talking about. Some sources place them uh, at the Battle of Schubert's Plantation in July of 1781. Uh, we know that the Royalists were there, it's less clear. Uh, we know Balfour is referring to the, rain, the Royalists as the Rangers, but are the Royalists with them? We don't know. Uh, in November or so of 1781, Harrison, having had his property uh, seized now, uh, he's managed, even though the rebels had carried off most of his slaves, he apparently had a few, and he's apparently gathered up a few enslaved people uh, for himself. Uh, and because he had seven people at the start of the war enslaved, now he has 14, and the rebels had taken some, so he's probably compensated himself. 
Uh, he sends them uh, with an, a gentleman named David Denning and his family. Uh, Denning goes to East Florida, which is still under British control, gets a land grant in Harrison's name, uh, and he and his family and these enslaved people begin clearing land uh, for a new plantation for Harrison. It's on the St. John's River, but uh, that is, uh, of course, that doesn't amount to anything because the British end up ceding East Florida to Spain. Uh, on December 24, 1781, we have a uh, return showing one company of the Rangers at the Quarter House with Harrison at command. It has two lieutenants, an ensign, four sergeants, and 47 rank and file fit for duty, two listed as sick, and 23 listed as prisoners with the enemy. So this is still a fairly substantial number. Harrison leaves uh, with the evacuating British force when the, most of the provincial troops are taken out in October 1782 from Charleston, and they are sent to East Florida. And a few of his followers who remain actually continue fighting low-level guerrilla war. Some people have talked about how these wars went on afterwards. Uh, they stay uh, into 1782, and some people say maybe into the next year or so, uh, some of them were conducting guerrilla war. Uh, Harrison stayed in East Florida at least until October of 1783. Uh, by then, the South Carolina government had seized all of his property. Uh, he was awarded half pay that same month, uh, which he collected uh, until 1789, he collected the rank of captain. Uh, by May 1786, he was in England, uh, submitting additional information to support his claim. Uh, at some point, he reunited with his wife and children, maybe it, when they evacuated the Camden and other areas in May of 1781, maybe later, that's not clear. Uh, in that uh, document, he said he intended to go to the Bahamas, and a year later, he was living in New Providence, in the Bahamas. Uh, we don't know really what he did after that, except that he died in 1795. Uh, his brother, Captain Samuel Harrison, uh, who was about five years younger than him, was also awarded half pay. Uh, we don't know exactly where he lived, but he said to have died in 1816. It's interesting to know that despite the problems Harrison had and the Inconsistent, I think, is a good way to describe the record of his unit, although given the lack of training and proper equipment, uh, they didn't do too badly overall. Uh, but when Harrison filed his loyalist claim and needed testimony, Leslie wrote a good testimonial for him. Uh, Hamilton of the North Carolina loyalists did. Cornwallis, and I found this very surprising, you know, Cornwallis is always worried about his own political capital. So if somebody asks for a recommendation for loyalist claim, I say, well, he was acquainted and appeared to be, you know, a zealous loyalist or whatever. You know, he wrote a lukewarm claim for Edward, uh, support for Edward Fenwick's claim when it was turned out, uh, learned that Fenwick had, had uh, acted as a spy for the Americans late in the war. Cornwallis, you know, lived based in him in a letter to the Claims Commission. Uh, but uh, aside from John Harris Cruder, who got an amazing recommendation from Cornwallis, Harrison probably got the second best recommendation that Cornwallis put in the Loyalist claims. He said he, he you know, was a very strong, committed Loyalist. He sacrificed a lot. He did everything he could. He said he couldn't get as many men as he promised. But he said, I do truly believe that over the course of the war, he did recruit 300 men you know, and led them right to the end. Uh, and I think that is a pretty good testimonial because if you can get Cornwallis to pat you on the back, uh, you know, that, that's going some way if you're familiar with uh, Cornwallis' personality to any degree. Uh, so I will end there and ask if anyone has questions. Oh, we got a question in the back. Very, very interesting. No. Um, uh, uh, these uh, provincials that you uh, are done at the Rangers, I've often heard of the people out of uh, 96, weren't they a lot of loyalists? And, would, and then I have done some reading about what I call rogues. Well, how would they, these provincials sort of be like a rogue that was in the community rabble-rousing the Patriots, 
and perhaps even the loyalists in their activities that were there. And I was just wondering where they can join. And the group out of 96. Yeah, uh, there, were no, there was no real interaction between the, the loyalists in the eastern part of the state and in 96. There was a large loyalist population in, in the 96th district, uh, but a lot of them you know, had either pretty much given up in the five years before the British came back, or the most committed had gone uh, to a British colony. Some as refugees went as far as the Mississippi River or Pensacola. Uh, a lot of them went to St. Augustine. Uh, but there was a, a fairly good nucleus there. Uh, they, they, they were actually doing pretty well. I mean, despite the bad reports, Ferguson and Gray, who I mentioned in this paper, were very optimistic until King's Mountain, which is just a morale crusher. So, uh, but these loyalists, I, I wouldn't say they were rogues, although uh, they could be portrayed that way. I mean, some of them obviously were plunderers. You're going to get somebody uh, in any army, there's going to be people like that. It, it reminds me of you know, the Battle of Camden, Armand's Legion, that you know, they meet Tarleton on the road, they run, they meet, uh, when the militia starts to flee in the morning battle, they run, and the only casualty I've ever heard them inflicting in the, in the entire Camden campaign was when a Maryland officer, when the army was, had been broken, was retreating, he found the wagon where his trunk was, and some of Armand's men were looting their own army's wagons. <laughs> and when he tried to get his trunk back, one of our men's, men, men caught him with a saber. Uh, I mean, there, so you, you have characters like that in any war with any army. And undoubtedly, a few of these are with Harrison, just like you know, some were with any unit. How could I? You know, this is a tough war, and I'm putting you know my life on the line. How could I come out of this? With, you know, better off than I was before. But I think most of them would have been seen. I, I'd more term them as outcasts in an area that's where the revolution has a lot more support. Uh, being loyalists, refusing to you know take the oath to the state, or you know, to perform malicious service, they would have been seen as, uh, yeah, these aren't our, you know, yeah, they're, they're not like us, they don't really belong. And so they would, at the very least, they would have been shunned. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Dave. Yeah, this seemed like a real up and down uh, thing. Uh, yes, it seems like that uh, pretty much the we're talking about maybe a year and a half, or basically it's almost like the same, it was all steady, but, the ranges were so close between that and, you know, and uh, just less than good, I would say. Yeah. Why, would they, why would they even thought, I mean, after all the long period of time, they didn't seem like they make any progress, or maybe I'm just uh, feeling at that scene. Yeah, part of it could have been turnover in terms of troops. I mean, you have a certain level of attrition, people getting sick, people getting wounded. Um, you know, you take the wrong guys and leave some of them in Fort Watson when you, you set out and, you know, maybe, this, well, let's leave our better guys here because it's going to be just a small garrison in case Marion swings around and gets us. Um, I, I know the South Carolina Royalists, I ran into that. The regiment, yeah, at the Siege of Savannah, they actually call the Spring Hill Redoubt. People go and tour it, like some of Clinton's army uh, who end up at Savannah on the, when that whole expedition, the whole you know, sea-going disaster of storms and contrary winds. Uh, and they go around and they refer to the Spring Hill Redoubt as the Carolina Redoubt in many cases because the Royalists defended it and they, I mean, their reputation was, you know, high. Musgrove's Mill, now they don't do as well, but Innes writes after, he said, I had 50 of the Royalists with me, but only 15 were veterans, the other 35 were new recruits. So I think there's quite a bit of turnover in this unit. And and so that may account for some of it that you know some some of the guys they they come in a way they're like militia I think you know they come and go I'm going to go home and check on my family or you know I'm going to just sit this one out and. Um, Do you and, think and possibly I'm thinking of the same not a same but uh, John Harrison's commander. He just he had no he had nowhere else to go 
because he, he couldn't, he had no really other options here to stay or to basically escape. And maybe he just felt like, oh, I'll just flip a coin and I can't, I can't change much, but at least that's better than doing nothing. Yeah, and I mean, he's fairly committed. And again, he's got a lot of responsibility. He's not in command of a provincial unit. And we know he did some malicious service, peacetime malicious service. What it really is leadership qualifications. You know, it, he doesn't have any real experience. And now he's commanding this because you know, yeah, he's a man of influence, so people, he could get people to enlist. Uh, you know, some of these commanders turned out well, some don't. He probably didn't do too badly considering the situation he had in the uh, independent streak of some of these shows. So yeah, I'm <laughs> sure thank it was. You. I was going to say thank you so much. Dave, you guys have a lot of talk about this.